Um, it is common for folks, though, to socialize and medicate outside afterwards. So if you want to hang out, you know, you know, Jeff's going to give the demo, and then we're going to, you know, we'll give away the raffle stuff, and then, you know, people kind of hang out and mingle and then puff outside, and then I hear that there's quite a party down on the dock and on the boat afterwards. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the, um, the, the ferry workers actually tell me that they, they actually know about us and about our <laughs> And um, so they think it's cool because they, anyway, so we've got a reputation. <laughs> All right. It's a good reputation. Yeah, it's a really good reputation. Nobody's <laughs> bummed out with us. So, so, um, so tonight's demo is from Jeff Church, also known globally as Cannabis Reverend. Jeff has mastered every modern extraction technique and most of the ancient ones. He has traveled the world to learn uh, both exotic techniques as well as spread modern techniques from the United States. Last year, he went to Spanibus in Spain and turned on all sorts of the world-famous cannabis legends onto rosin oil and gave rosin dabs at the Cannabis Museum there in Spain. He is a patient advocate from way back. Uh, he has been on the front. Uh, he has been in front of the laws, helping people, uh, helping humans get relief since the very early days here in Washington. Jeff is presently an extractor at 502 Processor Puff and Farms, and he continues to consult everywhere as well. Um, he and his wife have also just welcomed their second child into the world, too. So that's a win. So, so Jeff is absolutely one of my mentors, but even more so, I am grateful to be able to call him a friend. It is very much my honor to present to you Jeff Church. Thank you for that warm introduction, Shango. That was wonderful. So uh, I'm glad that everybody came out here tonight. It's a wonderful, wonderful crowd for a really great method of hashish extraction. So tonight we're talking about bubble hash, and it's pretty simple. It's ice, water, and agitation. That's pretty much it. Beyond that, you have screens that filter out different sizes of particles. So you'll have uh, your plant material in one, uh, and then you'll have all of your valuable resins on, uh, on other sizes. So it takes a little while uh, for the cannabis to rehydrate, uh, and so I'm gonna dump that into the water right now. I've got a bucket over here, five gallon bucket, uh, filled up you know, a little over halfway, uh, and I've got some ice in there that's been cooling the water. Um, this is uh, 133 grams of what was the strain, Shango? Uh, California Girls. California Girls. Seeds, some, are, seeds are from Humboldt. Yeah, some Vashon outdoor uh, cannabis right here. So it's, this is just little uh, tiny popcorn buds. Uh, so we'll toss it on in the water. And then, uh, so I've, I've iced this water previously, but I'm also gonna throw some more ice on the top of it. So it kind of makes a sandwich of ice, cannabis, and more ice on the top. Add a little bit more water here to the top just to make sure that all of the cannabis is uh, exposed to this cold, cold water. All right. So ideally, I like to let this soak for up to 30 minutes uh, to, to rehydrate the material, especially if it's uh, dry material. Um, you can also run fresh material that's uh, frozen, uh, they call it fresh frozen, um, and uh, it, it makes a really nice bubble hash, but it's not something that you really need to rehydrate. So you kind of toss it in there, everything's cold out of the freezer, you put it into the bucket, uh, and start going. Um, but so tonight I'm going to just do this dry, uh, dry material method. So what, what you do is uh, you've got several different uh, sizes of bags. Um, the smallest one that, that we have, which is going to go in first, is a 25 micron bag. And so it's, a, it's pretty simple. It's a 25 micron mesh on some kind of a, a, you know, <coughs> jacket type yes. material. Yeah, canvas type material. And uh, so we just set these bags in here. And, So I like to do all of my mixing in one bucket, 
uh, rather than inside of the bags. Uh, you know, kind of the first methods that people were doing, they were mixing inside of the bags, uh, but I found that it actually put some wear and tear on the bags. Uh, so that's not really something that you want to do if you want to save your, your, uh, your bags, give them as long of life as possible. These bags in particular are quite old. I, they've been being used for about 10 years now. So uh, yeah, so, so they will last quite well. Uh, I just got these back from a friend of mine that I had loaned them to. Uh, do you wash I, them in the machine, washable, or do you Yeah, so you, you can definitely wash them in the machine. I would say that uh, you, know, you want to save that uh, for doing that every once in a while, not with every run. What I like to do with the bags is, is I'll take them uh, after they're done and rinse all of the, uh, the material out of them. Uh, if there's any resin stuck to the screens, I'll take some alcohol and, okay. and use some alcohol to free the resins off of the screens and give it another, uh, another soak um, as well with some alcohol. And then I put it into a bucket uh, of water and just kind of uh, massage them around and get, get the... Hand uh, wash them. Yeah, give it a little hand wash so it's really gentle. Okay. Um, but you can also... Um, you can also put them into the washing machine, and, and I've, I've put you know a cup of vinegar in there okay. with them, and that kind of gets any kind of musty smell that they might have. It kind of cuts that down a bit, um, and then do make sure you do an extra rinse on them because okay. you don't want to have that vinegar flavor in there. Yeah, yeah. You know, if they still smell like vinegar, that's not a good thing. Um, so yeah, so the first the first bag was a 25 micron bag. The second bag is a 45 micron bag, and so these sizes. Uh, as they get larger, um, that's also a larger hole size of the screen. So, um, so then we'll move on to a 73 micron bag. Do you worry at all about like bacterial contamination or any kind of uh, molds or funguses from reusing bags or people with minimal washing? Yeah, definitely, definitely, and you know, uh, we've actually run into some, some issues uh, in the medical market uh, making products, um, you know, we, we had, uh, you know, we really don't know where the contamination came from, uh, but we had some samples that tested positive for E. coli. Uh, so yeah, so they never made it out to uh, to patients to, to smoke. We just destroyed uh, the material. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a concern. There's bacteria and and molds and, and such. They will grow on the material on, on the bag material. So um, you know, for a bag Yeah. So so like for. Yes, we do run we do run these bags at I five hundred two, and you know we're just very careful to keep them very clean. You know, it's, as soon as you're done uh, doing doing the wash, you, you want to make sure that you wash your bags as well. Are you using like water or no, just regular tap water? Just regular tap water. It's actually well water where, where I'm at, uh, but but it has really low parts per million uh, uh, in it, and it's it's very clean water. Um, a lot of people do use RO water though. That's definitely uh, reverse osmosis water is is a popular thing. People will, will make their ice cubes out of reverse osmosis water, and um, you know I haven't really gone to, to that length. Um, I, I I have. Um, used in the medical side, we had an ice machine that we were using, uh, and so we, we hooked up carbon filters to that. Uh, and that was good enough for us to, to have, uh, you know, have some, some good clean, clean water. But tonight we're just using bagged ice. <laughs> you know? so, and, and you know, I've, I've never really been too terribly worried about it for my own consumption, uh, uh, bacteria and, and things like that, but it's definitely a concern for the 502 market because your products are going to fail uh, microbial testing and you're going to have lots that you have to destroy, you know, um, or I guess you can technically extract those with other methods, but, you know, then you're extracting whatever the molds and bacteria are along with it. Um, so these first three bags that I put in here, the 25 micron bag, the 45 micron bag, and the 73 micron bag, are where you generally get uh, your hashish. Um, this next bag that I just slipped in here is a 160 micron bag. Um, and this one is, is your very largest uh, resin heads and plant material. So you'll, you'll get 
sometimes you'll, you'll get like a greenish uh, material that comes out of this. Um, the 190 micron bag, I have seen only a couple times anything that you'd really want to smoke come out of this, and that's from a plant that has extremely large resin heads. Um, but usually it's just kind of the green duff. It's, it's like a, an extra catch bag uh, for the plant material. Um, slip those in there. And then finally, <coughs> this blue bag is what's called the work bag. Uh, you know, that's, that's more, you know, the original name for it was the work bag. I don't do any of the work in there anymore, uh, like I said, because it'll break up the bag. Um, but this is a 220 micron bag uh, right here. Um, they used to sell a 250 micron bag, which I have one of and I rarely use, uh, that, that they kind of said was for commercial production so that you can make sure that you're getting the most resin out uh, of the plant material fastest. Um, the 220 micron bag might hold back a little bit of resin, it might get clogged um, a little bit, so doing successive washes will really help you get it out, but um, you know, I, the 250 micron, I kind of just moved away from that. So, so that's the bags right there. Uh, plant material will go in this, in this bucket here. Um, then we have this right here. Yes? Are the colors in the number standard? Yes, they are. Yeah, so the purple is going to be the 25 micron always. The 45 micron is white. Uh, the 73 micron is yellow. Um, there is a 120 micron. I'm just going to grab this as a prop. Bubble Man was kind enough to send down a whole set. So this is the coveted door prize right here. Yeah. Who yeah. <laughs> for sure is the kids, um, but so there's an orange color, and this is 120 micron. I'm not using it tonight, but it's definitely something that uh, I've used in the past. And uh, it will be an extra filter above your 73 micron that can lead to slightly uh, more pure product on your 73 micron. Um, but, you know, for, for the purposes of the demonstration tonight, it's not really necessary to splice it out too terribly much. Um, there's also one that I forgot. There's a 90 micron bag, which goes right above your 73, and it does the same sort of a thing, uh, kind of splitting the micron size up uh, so that you can have a tighter fraction of the resin heads uh, in, in size. Uh, and then, let's see, is there any other one that I'm forgetting? No. Uh, and then, you know, the 160 micron, red, green for 190, uh, and blue is the uh, work bag, um, the 220. So they're, they're always the same, at least in the bubble bag brand. Uh, there's lots of other brands out there, uh, but Bubble Man was the first one in North America to provide bubble bags. And so I've been using these bags for years and years. Yeah, since uh, 2001, I think, was the first time I got a set of bubble bags. So, yeah. And they actually, they offer, um, two different kinds of bags. They have the standard set here that I'm using, and then they also have the bubble bag light set, which is a slightly cheaper material, um, I guess, you know, not as heavy duty, um, and they don't carry a warranty like these ones do. These ones are a lifetime warranty. If you ever have anything that goes wrong with them, any one of the bags, they'll send you a new bag, no problem. So, and they've been really good about uh, about honoring that, even with the much larger sets. Uh, you know, it's it's been no problem to get reimbursed or get a new a new bag sent down. So, um, so yeah, the the one other screen that you have uh, is this, and this is a 25 micron uh, pressing screen. They call it a blotting screen. It's a pressing screen, and uh, basically, you the idea is you put your hashish on here, and then you're able to squeeze out a little bit of the excess water. And so that's, that's kind of what this is for. What we've kind of moved towards uh, in campus ex extraction is doing rosin, right? And so this right here was the very first screen, at least that I know of, uh, that was used for uh, making rosin. And so you put your hashish in here and, and you fold it over and then you, you uh, with heat and pressure, squeeze it and 
the hashish extrudes out of it. So, you know, I was actually down in Oakland uh, with a friend of mine, uh, uh, Space, and he and I were sitting around saying, hey, you know, how are we going to make this rosin? No, nobody had really put out there in social media world how to filter your rosin. Um, and so we're, we're saying, oh, geez, you know, really what we need is a filter because all of this material is just kind of running here and there. And we're going to get a little bit of high quality oil out of it, but most of it's contaminated with the rest of the hash. So um, I said, you know, hey, we, we need a filter. And my friend Spacey said, hey, I've got a filter. I've got a 25 micron filter. Let's do this. And so that it was uh, the method was born, <laughs> rosin right there. So. Um, so yeah, some of the other tools that, that we use, um, I like to dry on parchment paper. Um, parchment paper seems to be kind of the best method for you know, home, uh, home use at least. Um, and then on cardboard, uh, and so that the cardboard acts as, as a desk and it draws out the, the moisture from, from the hashish uh, that, that basically your paper will get wet, it'll draw the, the moisture out as well, and then that draws it away again. So it's kind of a, a way to mitigate um, having too moist of hashish, because you know, as we were discussing earlier, there's big issues with mi microbes. Uh, as, as far as I know, yeah, go ahead. One second. Uh, would there be any point in setting that on, on a, a low heat source? You would not want to apply heat to it. Actually, cold is, is better. Um, Heat will heat the resin and it'll melt. And any uh, th there's a possibility that there's going to be water in there if it hasn't dried all the way, and that water will kind of get clogged in inside of the resin. And it'll it'll lead to more mold. Um, so it's it's actually better to not have it in a hot uh, hot area. You don't want it in direct sunlight or anything like that. So you know just you know uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so, so the microbial issue is definitely, definitely a big thing. As, as far as I know, it's, it's about eight hours that uh, it takes for microbes uh, to start growing after water has been introduced to them. Uh, so in the drying process, there's going to be some amount of microbes and of bacteria um, that is going to bloom. Uh, and so you want to really use material that doesn't have microbes in large amounts. You, you want to kind of keep that as, uh, you know, it's just not advisable to, to run the material. Um, so in general, we're all moldy material. Yeah. Or material like powdery mildew or mites and such, things of that nature. You know, I mean, it's, it's always best to use the highest quality input that you can. It's going to give you the highest quality output. Um, so, but, uh, but for, you know, the 502 world, um, what, what we've kind of come up with now is a freeze dryer. And so if you take your material and it goes right into the freezer uh, and it's frozen, then you pop it into the freeze dryer, um, you're able to keep the material um, both, you're, you're able to get less oxidation with the material, so it's, it's gonna, stay a much lighter color, which is more uh, appealing to the consumer. Um, and you're also going to have this microbial issue is basically beaten, right? Because you don't give it the chance to bloom. The, the microbes aren't going to bloom in the freezer. The freeze dryer is going to sublimate the water away from the material. Uh, and so you're going to end up with a dry, sandy product that hasn't had the chance to kind of clump together and, and, and get, you know, glob together because it stays all dry. The resin heads are rock hard when they're cold. Uh, and so it's able to kind of dry everything. Um, and also put, freezing it will expand any water that's in there. So it actually kind of moves the resin heads away from each other just a, a slight bit um, so that it, you're, it's able to uh, dry inside of the patty that you can put into the freeze dryer. So, I really recommend that. I think that the freeze dryer is the, the best method for drying bubble hash that we've, we've come up with yet. So, um, But yeah, it, it progressed. I mean, when I first started making bubble hash, there wasn't even a recommendation to use cardboard. Um, and so it was like, 
you know, use like a paper plate or use a plate itself, you know, I mean, it was really, really, you know, th th there wasn't much out there for information. And then, uh, then we, we came up with the cardboard. Uh, cardboard seemed to work great, except for with uh, kind of the stickier resins, they would get stuck to the cardboard and you get pieces of paper that came out of it. So it's kind of not the best way. Parchment, when that, that idea came around, really kind of won me over for sure because uh, you're able to get the material off of the parchment without having uh, much of the parchment come off. Hopefully none of the parchment coming off. Uh, Jeff? Yes. So would it not work to decarb it before it started? Well, if you decarbed it, um, most likely the resin heads would melt. Uh, so they would be unaccessible by the water extraction method. Yeah. Yeah. So they would definitely. <laughs> I would say, unless you're doing really long, well, yeah, it's big enough. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So the rest of the tools here that I have, um, the pressing screen, the parchment. Uh, this, you know, this was just kind of a banker's box lid, uh, and it's just nice for transportation. So if you're going to make it somewhere and move it somewhere else, it's nice to have that. Um, I usually just cut up a, a cardboard box at home and then tape a piece of parchment to it, but this seems to be a nice method. Um, I like to use a sieve uh, to break up the, the bubble hash so that it can dry properly. So uh, you'll put all of your, your bubble hash into here and then take a uh, silicone spatula and kind of move it around and, and it'll, uh, it'll come through the sieve. Uh, and you can spread it out kind of evenly on this, this cardboard. And then I use just a dish brush uh, to kind of clean up uh, any excess uh, bubble that gets stuck to this tool so that you don't lose a whole bunch there. Um, you're able to get it back. And then, uh, you know, just a plastic card uh, is something that's nice to, to move out uh, the bubble hash if, it, if it's in too thick of a pile, if, if when you're working with your sieve, too much of it fell in one area, you can kind of move it around and, and uh, spread that out. Um, and then a, a spoon to get it out of the bags. And so I've used all kinds of different tools. Um, there's a lot of other great tools, but since we're just doing this for home use, I figured the spoon would be a great thing, because everybody has one of these. <laughs> yeah, so, um, right. We've got a few more minutes here. Any other questions that people have at the moment? Tell us about the different types of hash and why you would use one versus another. So the different extraction methods that are, that are out there? Okay, well, um, you know, we've got uh, this bubble hash. Uh, it's definitely a great method. It's a non-solvent method. Although the water is technically a solvent, there are terpenes that are water-soluble that are being extracted, but uh, it's it's kind of the, it, 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 it's the least of a solvent uh, of, of all of the methods out there. Um, then there's dry sift, so that would be using screens uh, and kind of doing a similar thing, uh, but without water, right? So that's that's another method. Dry sift is, is really nice. It kind of gives you the um, unadulterated uh, or un, uh, it, it's, it has the least refinement, I guess, of all the, the processes out there. Um, I've done a lot of uh, CO2 extraction as well, but that takes really expensive machinery, uh, and so that's not really a, a home method. Um, and, and that's that's a great solvent. It's you know something that's a fairly green solvent. A lot of the CO2 is just waste uh, from industry that's recaptured, and so that's definitely a, a nice way to, to use that. Um, Butane extraction, propane, you know, all of those things are, are interesting. What? Limonene. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, those, those hydrocarbon solvents uh, are great for getting the cannabinoid content out of the material economically. Right? So it's not very expensive for a setup uh, as compared to a CO2 extractor. Um, the, the time that it takes to do the extraction is much reduced uh, compared to a CO2 extractor. Um, but you know, each of these solvents has a specific uh, capacity for extracting the constituents. So certain things are going to be extracted uh, with your different solvents that wouldn't necessarily be extracted in the same 
way uh, from other solvents. Rick, would it be good to assume that if you use ethanol extraction, that you're taking all the terpenes in their natural form with you? Yeah, so that, that was actually the very next one that I was going to get to. So uh, uh, ethanol is a great uh, extraction medium. Um, it has the disadvantage that when you're going to uh, remove the ethanol uh, from, from the extract, you're also going to remove a lot of the terpenes, uh, especially the, the most volatile terpenes. Those are going to just hop on over with the alcohol and you're going to end up with a uh, terpene infu infused alcohol. Well, I've worried about that because alcohol is a, is a hydrotropic rather than hydrophobic, so it's, it's, it's going to, when they're together, it's going to hold a certain amount of water with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, that, you know, that's, it, that's definitely true, and, and also uh, it, it will extract the, the water content uh, of the plant material as well. So, uh, but it's definitely a great, uh, great extraction method. Um, that's, that's really good for RSO and such. Yes, sir. Um, does ambient room temperature have any play on um, like the manipulation of the, the hashish after being extracted or even during extraction? Yeah, so you know, with, with bubble hash uh, or dry sift, um, you really want to have uh, the coldest environment possible. That's that's the best way to go about it. You're you're doing this extraction in cold because the resin heads you know, harden up. Uh, it, they will also free themselves from the plant material a lot easier when they are hard. Uh, so they just shear off really easily, they just crack like ice would crack, right? Um, so, you know, I, I would definitely recommend that if you're going to do bubble hash on any kind of commercial scale, you would want to have a cold room. So, you know, either a walk-in freezer uh, that you're working in or having um, a room that you've outfitted with a uh, uh, an air conditioner that you've overclocked. There's a really cool gadget. It's called a, um, a cool bot, uh, and so you you hook this in there, and, and and basically it takes any air conditioner and tricks it. Um, it 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 will have a little heater uh, that heats up by the temperature sensor, so that the air conditioner thinks that it's not as cold as it actually is. And then it has a, another sensor that, that reads the outtake of the condenser so that it knows when the condenser is going to ice over. So basically, make sure that you're not going to destroy your equipment, but at the same time, it overclocks it and makes it so you can get it down to, I think it's uh, in the high 30s is, is what you can get with one of those. But, but you know, I, I see a lot of people set their rooms at 55. That's a common um, extraction temperature. So, um, and doing doing everything. You know, the moment that I that I pull the hashish out of the bags, it's warming up. And so, by the time I get it into this uh, to the sieve, if I don't work fast enough and it's a really gooey strain, it's just going to gum up all over this this sieve uh, and, and, and become a problem. So. Um, you want to work fast when, when you're doing that. That's kind of what, what we've always done. And then, you know, now the new method is cold rooms, you know, and then you don't have to be as stressed about how fast you're doing everything. So, yeah. So you only make hash in a month with an R. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely a, a good way to do it. Um, and it happens to be when uh, the harvest is in, usually. So traditionally, I, I, I've made the bulk of the hashish in the last month of the year and you know January and February as well so those are kind of you know December January February are really really great months for making hashish so. yes sir so I'm sorry I don't want to like tear off like two advanced topics but I'll forget if I don't ask you Surely. so um, a lot of the people that uh, that I see that make hash um, I'm pretty good on Instagram and stuff these guys have a tendency to uh, allow the bubble to dry in patties uh -huh. for up to, let's call it, 8 to 12 hours or, or even longer in cold rooms or refrigerators or something to keep my cold or break down. And then they will either sieve or uh, microplane. Right. And um, so my question to you is, it, it sounds like you're, at least in this particular uh, lesson, you're uh, an advocate of 
taking that bubble quickly, going through the process very quickly, getting it out there spread out so that it can dry very quickly, uh, not or waiting that time and such. And I'm just wondering, from your point of view, um, do any of the methods that I'm talking about previous to that, do they hold any kind of water in, uh, creating a more palatable product or something that may be more melty or, or whatever you know, the consumer happens to be? Right. So, so I would say that, that there's definitely advantages to doing the cold cure, right? <laughs> putting, putting your hashish into uh, a cold refrigerator or a you know, freezer um, as well uh, before you would microplane it. Um, if you're going to be using the sieve, I don't really see as much advantage of that because you're going to have, uh, it's going to be so cold that it's going to harden it if you put it into the freezer um, that, that it's kind of going to be hard to get through the sieve. But the microplane is definitely a nice way to go for um, really sticky material. So if it's going to come out of your bags and it's going to be really, really sticky, um, you're going to want to use a microplane. And that'll actually rupture a lot of the heads uh, when, when you're doing the, the microplaning. But, uh, and it could lead to a little bit of terpene loss. But if you've got a really, really sticky product anyways, you're going to have a high terpene content in there as well. So Would it, that lead to a more greased out product even after it's dry? So. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. So, but, you know, the resin heads are, are all created differently. There's, you know, there's different amounts of, uh, of kind of liquefiable contents, I guess is what we could say. So the cannabinoids and the terpenes are, are really the liquefiable contents of, of it. There's, there's also wax, uh, there's, uh, there's a membrane, there's a cuticle. And so some of those uh, constituents that are in, in the resin head don't really melt. So on some strains, you're going to have, you know, pure, pure, resin where you don't really see any other contamination when you look under a microscope, but it's not as melty when you smoke it uh, just because of the nature of the genetics, right? Um, and then other strains um, are going to be super, super melty uh, and, and hard to deal with when you're, when you're processing. So that's those types of strains really want to do in the cold room. Uh, doing a, a cold cure is definitely a good way to go, but I think that nowadays, if, if you're going to go through the trouble of making that cold room, get a freeze dryer. You know, if you're going to be working with that type of material, uh, because it's you're not going to have to do all this cold curing. Uh, you're not going to have to do the microplaning. So you can actually take this this material that previously, with other methods, you would have to microplane, and instead you do the freeze dryer, and it comes out dry uh, like keef. Um, now, when you're pulling that material out of the freeze dryer, it's frozen, right? So if you're not in a cold environment, you're going to have condensation, right? So it's going to bring water from the atmosphere and put it right back onto your hashish. So you definitely want to have uh, an environment that you're doing it in that's cold if you're going to be pulling it out of the freeze dryer. So, yes, you can go. Would you share why it's called bubble hash? Bubble hash. Well, uh, it's bubble hash because of the bubbles that form when you smoke it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so the, the, the more pure that it is, uh, the more boiling effect that you're going to have when it smokes. So just like a dab boils when you, when you drop it on the dab rig, it's the same sort of a thing. Uh, there really, you know, when bubble hash first came around, there really wasn't um, as much oil and there was you know as much of that going on this is really a pure pure method uh, of extraction so that that really explained what the product was itself that's being produced so. can you go ahead and tell us about the store chart yeah definitely definitely um, so so there's a, a my good friend space down in Oakland um, who I worked with on, on developing the you know rosin screen method. Um, him and his partners down there at the Bazaar, which was a uh, Measure Z Club in Oakland. So Measure Z Club is actually a place where you're allowed to consume and sell cannabis and the city of Oakland will kind of turn their head the other way and, and, and not worry about you because they have a law that was passed in Oakland, Measure Z, which made it the lowest enforceable priority for adult consumption and sales 
in a private setting. So as long as you're not doing it out in public, then it's, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so they, they decided that they really needed to have a hashish rating system uh, because, you know, back then it was really, you know, all hash was kind of like 20 or $25 a gram retail. There wasn't really too much difference in price, even though the quality could be drastically different. Right? So they came up with this star rating system. It's a one through six star rating system. Uh, and so it starts off with one star being the lowest. Uh, and that's basically keef that's something that you really couldn't uh, press very easily with, with just you know the, the heat and pressure from your hand. Uh, you couldn't really press it into a patty. It just kind of crumbles. So that's, that's one star. Two star is something that you press together. Um, and then when, uh, and it'll hold, and when you smoke it on a screen, it has a slight melt to it. It'll kind of have the sheen where you can kind of tell that the oils have done something, but it's not really boiling. It's not really bubbling, right? Um, then three star, uh, it'll go from whatever shape you put it in, uh, and it'll melt into kind of a pile. Right? So like a, it'll make like a haystack kind of a pile out of whatever you put onto the screen, and it'll boil up into that pile. Um, a four star will melt for, uh, down into a puddle. So it'll be kind of a boiling puddle with contaminant, so uh, non-melty uh, constituents all over it, in, the, in that puddle. Um, and it'll kind of have like a, there'll be like a, a flat, a flat chunk of contaminant after it stops melting. Uh, five star, uh, it'll melt down into the puddle and it'll actually boil the contaminant out to the edges of the screen. If you, these are all um, being rated on the screen because it's kind of the easiest way to view uh, what's, what's actually happening with the melt. Um, so the contaminant will get pushed out and it'll boil a big clear dome uh, so it's, it's a, a big bubble uh, that, that has no contaminant in it, except for on the very edges of it, and it actually shows uh, the screen. So you'll have a bare spot in the middle of the screen and contaminant uh, in a ring around the edge. Um, and then six star, uh, which is you know, the height of, uh, of what you can produce, um, will boil and it, it doesn't really collect contaminant in any one place in particular. Uh, there's going to be very, very little contaminant on the screen, and most likely it'll melt right through the screen and you won't have anything left over there. Uh, so that's kind of the star rating system. And I brought that up here in Washington, and uh, uh, a lot of the community in the medical community adopted that uh, star rating system as, as well as uh, the company that uh, I was working for at the time, or owned at the time, Conscious Extracts. So uh, we kind of pushed that forward here. Yes, sir? <laughs> so, sorry, this is going to happen to you all. Oh, no, that's great. I love, questions. I love questions. I love questions. So in watching you put together the bags, at least for this demonstration, uh, you probably skipped a couple. Yes. And uh, which, you know, totally I, I get how all that puts together. So in looking for a, a hash at the end, as far as uh, your product is concerned, if you're trying to achieve that six-star rating, do you feel it is absolutely always necessary to use all the bags and split it up? Or is, it, is there a way to tell, or is there a way to at least guide me towards knowing, okay, I can use the 73 and the 90 and maybe the 120 together, leave the 45 out, or uh, leave, you know what I mean? Like, how, how, how do you go about deciding what bags you're going to use to try to find a medical product? Right, so, so really, you know, I mean, for, for today's market, the 502 market, um, I really like to have two grades, right? Um, and so having a lot of different bags, that's kind of tough, right? Um, but, but you can also have a third grade that would be all of the other, uh, all of the other grades that aren't the super melty varieties that you can press into browser. So, so yes, it's definitely, um, 
it's definitely something that, that you would want to have more screens in there if you're going to try and make that six star. Um, but really, that six star is dependent not on the screens that you use, but on the material that you that you have. So if you have good starting material, you're going to have an amazing product. And if it's a five star where you're using less of the bags, you throw another one in there. You might think that six star. Um, because uh, you know, because you had a little bit more filtration, and you were able to get out a little bit more of the contaminant. Um, but yeah, it's all about the material. The material is is key for sure um, in the process. So. All right. Well, I'm going to start this up. I think it's uh, probably been uh, yeah, it's been long enough here. So I like to um, I like to. See to uh, do a five-minute spin. I've got my, my drill here, and it, it's got a variable speed on it, so it's able to go slow, it's able to go fast, and this is a cement mixer, and I really like this, uh, I really like this head here. It's, uh, it's rounded, right? So you don't have any sharp edges. Sharp edges are going to lead to breaking your material up. So if you've got the rounded edges, it's going to just thresh your material. It's going to bump into it. Your resin heads are going to fall off, and your plant material is not going to break up as much. So we'll give her a whirl here, five minutes. <laughs> If you guys want to look, you're welcome to come up here and have a look at the skin. So, uh, five minutes of agitation, and then I'll take this and, and just dump it into this bucket here. I usually dump almost all of it, and then give a little squish to get any resin that might be down at the bottom. I also like to keep my bucket clean, so I'll usually put, put some water in there and wash out any last little bits. And then we wait again. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, yeah, five more minutes, um, and then uh, I like to give it a little stir. Um, so usually in practice, uh, it's it's either five or it's it, it's either ten or fifteen minutes. Um, I wait from the time it stops mixing until I start pulling the bags out. Um, so tonight we'll just do the 10 minutes just to... What are we waiting for? Wait. So what we're waiting for now is the resin to sink, right? So right now there's kind of this matrix of uh, plain material and, and ice and water and all of these things, and the resin is denser than water. And so it will actually sink down to the bottom. and so. We're waiting for it to, to do a little bit of sinking, and then uh, then we can also give a little more agitation five minutes later to kind of mix any bits that are still stuck on the plant material that have settled on plant material, and uh, allow that to drain down. So, yeah. Any merit to putting on a little low vibration table? I mean, uh, totally could. I've never done it before, um, but uh, but I you know. Seems like it might it, it might help move things down, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, people definitely do that with Keith, right? When they're making Keith, they put a little vibrator on their Keith screens and and bounce the the resin off, so you don't have to break the plant material up, and you can kind of just you know if it's cold in the room, it should shear off really well. So um, I had a question about uh, washing machines, right? So there's. Uh, there's kind of two two ways to go about it. Uh, this this method, you know, at first it was like a cake mixer, right? That's that's what I used for years. Um, then we moved to the drill uh, or the paint mixer, and the paint mixer, it you know, it was it was good, but. When I found the cement mixer, it was just that, that, that perfect tool. <laughs> so yeah, so it's kind of a progression over the years. But but the uh, the washing machines are, are really an interesting method. So what you what you do with the washing machine is you um, you fill the the little it's like a desktop type washing machine. They actually make bigger ones as well. Um, but uh, you fill it with some ice and water, and then you put your plant material into a bag, 
that is all the mesh that's at the bottom of this 220 micron. So it's all 220 micron, it has a zipper on it. And uh, you put that into uh, your washing machine and just turn it on. And so you can set it for however many, many minutes you want to do your, your wash. And then it's got a little hose and you drain it right into your bags, right? So that's definitely an easy way to do it. Um, I've seen similar qualities uh, come, come from it. I would say that if you're doing the fresh frozen, uh, I've seen a lot, a lot of people have better success with fresh frozen using the washing machine than they have with the drill, right? But with the dry trim, it seems that the drill is better for me at least. So that's kind of my personal, personal preference there. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. So I'm going to assume that you're at work, you probably use the like 20 gallon washers then? Um, at work, we do dry material there. Um, and so we actually uh, use this same setup, but in 32 gallon bins. Um, so they're, they're just uh, uh, rubber made uh, brute trash bins. Uh, but we actually buy the, the white ones that are food grade, right? So they're actually, it's, it's a little higher quality plastic. You can actually put food into them. Um, and uh, yeah, but then we use the freeze dryer. For the finish. So, so if I'm um, sorry, I guess are, are you using the bigger washing machines or we what? we don't use a washing machine. You're just doing it by hand. Yeah, the same exact uh, same, same, same exact thing. thing. Yeah, I use okay. a little bit beefier of a drill uh, at work. This is just like my personal <laughs> home drill, you know. Um, but, but the same mixing head um, I, I use uh, on, on the 20 gallon set. And then are you draining? Oh, you're draining into a 20 gallon set of bags. Yeah, so I've got a 32 gallon uh, trash bin okay. that actually holds the 20 gallon uh, set of bubble bags. Just kind of, that's you know, the trash bin that works the best for, for those bags. And I, I've seen bags that are, uh, that are sidewalls are all mesh, or at least extended mesh. Would you, do you have you ever used those? Do you like those? Um, yeah, you know, I, the, the all mesh bags are definitely, uh, definitely great. Um, but I would say, um, yeah, I just, I just use the bubble bags because it's what I have and it's what I've used for years. And, and uh, I, I really like to uh, support the public man in his endeavors, uh, although he doesn't really need too much of my support nowadays. <laughs> but, uh, so draining yeah. into 20-gallon bags is not like a big deal. Like, I couldn't imagine trying to drain a 20-gallon trash can into a 5-gallon uh, set of bags. That would probably take a lot, right? So, right. So you use the bigger bags and 20-gallon bags. Does that just drain quicker? Yeah, you know, uh, you, you're just able to hold all that water in there. Yeah, so if you're, if you're doing it into, you know, if you're draining your big 20 gallon washer, uh, you probably want a 20 gallon set of bags to hold all that water so that you can drain it all at once. Um, there's also uh, a lot of people will use uh, another method um, where they'll cut the buckets, right? And then they'll stack, they'll, they'll put one, one bag in each bucket. Right? And then stack the, the, these buckets inside of each other. And the, the very bottom one, they've just got a whole bunch of holes drilled in the bottom of it. And they do it in a sink or they do it outside where it's okay for the water to just drain. Um, or do it in, into a big tub, you know, where they've got it kind of raised up. Um, and then you could use a 20 gallon washer with a 5 gallon bucket. Right? So, and, and if you're using the all mesh screens, there's much more surface area of, of mesh for, for your water to move through, because that's, you're moving your, your hashish through it, but it's also really how fast is your water going to drain through, right? So, so yeah, the all mesh bags are great for kind of doing that sort of a method where you're using the smaller bags but a larger washer. Yeah, yes? Okay, if you were, Trying to make something for someone with cancer, so you know, usually I've been making the uh, alcohol extraction. Mm -hmm. Do you think because this has got more of the terpenes in it, it would be a better medicine? Well, it just really depends. I, I would say that uh, you're going to have um, more of a strain specific effect from bubble hash, right? Because it has all of those terpenes in there. Um, I don't really. 
Ethan, he just he just left. He'd probably be the the one to talk to about about that. Uh, you know, whether having uh, something with that's full of terpenes would be better for somebody with cancer. I'm not 100% sure. I have not done enough studying for that. But I will say that you really see um, the modulating effects of the different strains, uh, the terpenes that, that are in there from bubble hash versus having an alcohol extract where a lot of those terpenes are gone or changed because in the heat process, they do change uh, you know, uh, and break down molecularly. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's the other thing. So this would not be decarb, right? So, you know, if you were going to eat just bubble hash straight, it would be a THC acid that you're consuming rather than a THC that's been converted. Unless you smoke it. Unless you smoke it. And then during the, the act of smoking, it's, it's doing that decarb, yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Jeff, are we doing really well? We've got about a 15 minute window left. Is that yeah, I'm going to pull this and we'll, we'll have it on the tray within 10 minutes. Of oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and so I would say that, uh, that when I'm doing this uh, at home, uh, I'm going to be doing four washes or at work. Uh, I do four washes. Um, I've done up to 12 washes on certain strains and come up with multi material. What I like to do at home is do the four washes and then take it and throw all of the plant material into a crock pot, take some of this bubble water um, that's left over and fill the crock pot up and throw a whole bunch of coconut oil into the crock pot and, uh, and cook that to get the remaining cannabinoids out of the plant material. Um, so I think that's, that's really a great method to get the best of both worlds. You get something really nice to smoke and you get something that's going to be very effective to eat as well. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, let's get going here on this. Uh, so, I like to give a little jiggle while it's in the water, just to kind of uh, get <laughs> pull up, pull some hashish out of my hand. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I like to, to give it a little shake to get any of the resin that has gone down to the bottom uh, to drain. And when I'm doing my first, sec first and second uh, pulls, I really try to just pull it out and kind of move it around like this so that the water is draining over the different parts of the screen and washing any of the resin heads out of there, but not squeeze. If you okay. squeeze it, you're going to have a lot of the plant material that has broken down go through there. Right now the plant material has floated up to the top and the resin heads have, have come down to the bottom. And so you want to try and keep that separation as much as you possibly can. Um, in the third and fourth run, however, I, I start giving it a little bit more of a squeeze to make sure that I'm getting the most out of it. But those are lower grade um, end results. So, um, so you take your bucket, come back over to it. Um, I like to kind of stretch the bag back over it. And then you just dump it back in there. So that's, that's ready to go again for another wash. And it's always handy to have a, a nice place to set your bags as you're pulling them. You know, so another bucket. Uh, Set off to the sides. Jeff, if you're going to do that a second time, will you pick the second bucket up so everybody can see it? Second bucket. The one on the floor. This one here. Yeah. yeah. I don't. Know, I don't know if you're going to do that for every wave. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so I mean, we're just going to do the one tonight because for for time. But right on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that's that's what we've got there. Um, so if you were doing this for real. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, really if I'm going to do four washes, would you have that one back on ice at this point in time? Well, it's, it's, it's still on ice, and so all these bags. It's still got ice in it? Yeah, yeah, there's plenty of ice in there. Both guys. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, so it's just plain material that's been threshed a little bit. So then, as you pull your screens, I like to, to take the screen and fold it over like this. Uh, it, it gives you kind of this shape where it draws everything down into a cone down here. So instead of it being a flat, circular screen, uh, so, and then just give it a little dunk to make sure that you've gotten all the resin that can fall through the screen uh, to fall through. Is there any advantage to doing uh, four washes as opposed to like one water wash? Well, so so there's in the bag or when it's in the bag after you've done your mixing, there's resin that's stuck on the plant material, and so it kind of helps wash it more. Um, so if you if you were to do 20 minutes say of, of mixing, um, you're going to have the disadvantage of it's going to be broken up. So you're going to lose that ability to have the higher quality resin that you pull from the very beginning of it, um, and you're going to get a little bit less. So. <laughs> so every pull kind of degrades in quality a little bit. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, and and degrades in yield as well. So there's going to be less and less of a yield. Uh, so, with that being said, let's just say the, the 90 micron that you pull on pole one, is that not the same as the 90 on pole three? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I would say, depending on what you, how your material is, um, if there's a lot of dirt in it, or you have powdery mildew, or you have issues like that, that first wash might be lower quality than the second, right? So uh, when I'm working with outdoor material, a lot of times I'll throw the material into the water and then without beating it up, just kind of getting it all wet, uh, throw it in the bags and, and pull that out so that you wash off any of that dirt. Like no. Exactly, exactly. But you don't want to beat it up. You don't want right, to right. You know, do it too much because the resin is going to fall off. Yeah. So, uh, but then that resin can be saved. What you do get, the dirt and the resin, uh, can be safe to make process. You still do that in like cold water, right? Like, um, yeah, you know, I actually don't put ice in there, but it's like cold out of the tap. Cold from the tap. Yeah, yeah, right. So, Jeff, can I ask you though, Buffett, in we call the rains we had this year, did you have much dirt on those flowers out there? Um, you know, th there's definitely some dirt on the bottom pieces for sure. Yeah. Uh, that, that came up. Like splash up. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. It's the cleanest microbial accounts ever. Yeah. Out, outdoor cultivation is definitely, you're going to have some, some dirt. You're growing in dirt in the rain and it splashes back up onto the plant. So, <laughs> you try a lot of Oregon growers have to uh, burn a lot of their crops because they're not passing the uh, microbial pesticide. Yeah, I saw the huge pile of cannabis that one grower just mountain of cannabis that he burned because he's like, ah, right, it just went to mold, you know. They grew so much cannabis this year that they couldn't take care of it all, you know. And that's, that's a problem with a lot of the 502 farms. They, they don't plan for, um, you know, when they're first startup, you know, they, they don't really plan for for having issues like that. So, um, so yeah, this is a... So the, the resin will collect itself on the screen. I like to give a little wash to, uh, it, does, it does a couple things. It gets it all down into, into the center of the screen, but it also washes away some of the smaller particles that you haven't gotten out of there. And it also washes this water that is basically a canvas tea. It washes that out of the product. So it gives you a little bit cleaner product. Um, but in practice, it, you know, I would use a pump sprayer, like a agricultural sprayer with ice. So it's going to be cold, cold water that you're spraying in here. Just to make the are you just spraying <laughs> around the inside of the bag, or are you actually like trying to force material through? Yeah, you're you're really spraying the the resin the itself. Resin. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll come around. And you guys can peer in here and see. Yeah. Well, it's just water. 
Pulling up first part of the suction. So I'm, I'm just drawing the water through the screen by pulling down on it. Um, you can also use these pressing screens, uh, but for this small amount, I'm just going to use this, uh, this method here. And so, um, so you take your spoon. say probably not very much. It's going to be, I, I, I couldn't really say for sure because I haven't done the research to be able to, to, to tell. Um, yeah, but, but I would say, you know, what, what you have there is the stops. You also have the, the rosette of gland cells, which is like kind of the manufacturing plant for all the terpenes and cannabinoids inside the rosette. Um, so that's going to be in there. There's, there's, you know, that, that's kind of what, what you have there. Yeah. yeah. Do you find using a smaller sieve is easier than using a larger one? This little sieve I would not use in practice. I would actually use a little bit larger of one because it's, it's much easier to, to deal with. But this is what I could grab. <laughs> you know, uh, I actually use this. Uh, my favorite sieve is one from uh, is one from IKEA. It's called the Idealist. And so it's, it's like about this big, and you can put a kilo of resin into the thing and, and sip it. So, so yeah, when you're, when you're scaling up and doing a lot larger, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of the way to go. So, yeah. So then I just take the bag off, and there's, there's a little bit of resin left on there, but not too terribly much. And I just come over here and give it a little wash. This water's really cold, so it's going to help aid getting it to, out of there and there we go. And so over here this looks fairly good. I'm just going to kind of it up just a little bit really quick. And uh, all of the uh, tools I use this brush on. Uh, so you can just brush the any of the resin that's going to stick to it. And if you brush it off right away, it doesn't stick so much to the card that you can't get it all off, otherwise it's going to cake up. It's, 
just gets nasty. But you can keep your tools pretty clean uh, by using that. Uh, yeah, so then the 45 micron. So 73 is generally going to be your um, highest grade, right? Most cannabis plants produce a, a trichrome head that, that falls in that 73 micron and above uh, state. Um, there are a lot of sativas that have smaller resin heads. Uh, and there's a lot of you know different different varieties that have larger resin heads, but kind of you know as as a cross section of, of the size of resin heads out there, uh, the 73 seems to be a really good screen to capture them on. When you say the 73 is generally the, the better one, what, what is it about the, that that's better? Is it like the more terpenes or more more resin higher THC? Or more um, resin well, higher? okay, so when you're washing it, uh, you're, you're adding contaminant as well as freeing the, you're freeing contaminant and freeing resin heads. And so if, you, if you're taking the, the fraction that has the most resin heads present in the plant material, you're going to have the least amount of contaminant, right? So you, you're, you're able to have a higher quality product just because you've got more resin that was in the plant. Yeah, so. You mentioned cuticles before and their thickness. Uh, how big of a role does that have in like helping to get off uh, the, 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 the head of the, um, the stalk without damaging it or opening it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely huge, uh, you know, um, some resin, even when it's really, really cold, uh, is going to be cemented to the stock, you know, and so it's going to be really hard to thresh it away. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just, you just kind of, you've got to work with your material, find out if it's a if it's worthwhile to, to process that type of material with that method, and if it's not, send it over into a solvent category. Do you, do you find like more ease uh, in, with certain types, like a, like a sativa, do you find that what, a thinner cell wall so it's easier to manipulate over an indica or? Yeah, I mean, I would say like Af Gooey is, is one of my very favorite strains. Um, and it, it, it just, the resin flies free from the plant material and it's also really cake thin resin. Um, but that's also one of those strains that I've run up to 12 times. And uh, on the 12th run, it was still a three star. So it was very much worth it for me to do that, but I was just tired at the end of the 12th, <laughs> 12th runs. Yeah. yeah. Cash muscles. Hey, Jim. Yes. If you did run up to that situation, could you just let the marijuana sit overnight in cold water in the fridge or something and start over the next day? Oh, bro. You know, I. I wouldn't. I, I would not recommend soaking it for too long. Um, I think that there's going to be some. I, I I don't have any definitive proof, but but I believe that there's going to be some amount of water that's going to come into the resin head itself and kind of moisturize that resin. Uh, and so, I think that 30 minutes of soaking is is kind of where you want to be. Yeah. Kind of on the side of that because I have done that. Basically, you've been like, oh, I gotta go to bed, I can't do it, you know? Right. Uh, when you come back the next morning, even if you got tons of ice in there, your plant material is just gonna be mush. And then if you run it again, you're gonna have so much like excess uh, contaminant, like we were talking about. Right. The plant material is gonna break up. Yeah. This one I pulled just a little bit wet. Than the first one, so you can kind of see what not to do. <laughs> uh, you want to have an amount of moisture in there, uh, but you don't want to have too much moisture in there, or else it just kind of cakes together. You can see that the pieces that did go through the sieve uh, on the second part are, are more clumped together, and that's not ideal, right? So you want it to be more free, free pieces there. Yeah, so, so kind of, uh, like, see how there's a, uh, 
Itself, uh, isopropyl alcohol is great, um, but uh, usually just water is, is what I like to work with. So, you know, to get too strong. <coughs> but if you use warm water, will it melt on it and mess things It's up. going to melt on there, okay. then you're going to need some uh, <laughs> cold water. Yeah, yeah, cold water, exactly. Right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you, uh, yeah. No. And so, when you're draining the last bag, it's a little slow. You can kind of give it a little up and down jerk like that, uh, but gentle. Don't go too much. If you're doing it on the big 20 gallons, I don't suggest that. There's a whole other method that you would use, but because uh, it can rip the screen doing this. Uh, but this this will free the resin heads that are clogging the screen and get them back into the water and uh, allow for more of the water to drain more rapidly. Yeah, this is the 25 micron here. Would you consider that to be a lesser quality than some of the other ashes? Uh, um, it just it, it just depends. I would say on the stream, possibly. Um, <laughs> what I what I ran yesterday was a bunch of stevens, and uh, the 25 micron was actually really nice. So um, the 73 was still my highest grade, um, but uh, but it was it definitely still melted. Um, I think the 25 is a great rosin. Uh, I, rosin's my answer for anything that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> um, say rosin, what is rosin? Rosin is a, uh, a method of heat and pressure extraction. And, uh, and, and, and what, you, what you do is you basically take a heat source. A lot of people like at home can use like a, a flat iron like uh -huh. for straight the hair okay. straightener. Um, and you use parchment and you take the hashish, you put it into a screen, you fold that over, uh, and then you've got it in between a piece of parchment, and you take the hair straightener and squish it, and the liquefiable contents, the cannabinoids, the terpenes, some of the waxes, some other constituents that are inside of the resin will move outside of the screen and you can collect them. And all of the contaminant, the, the non-milty uh, parts of, of, of the hashish will stay in the screen. Okay. So. Yeah, so it's a way to make uh, hash oil uh, without solvents. Yeah. And I also like to kind of get this little tug as well yeah. while I'm draining. Or well, well, I'm scraping to keep it you know, from being wet. There's moisture on the other side of the screen, and the moment you stop pulling on that and creating the suction, the moisture wicks right back in the oh. <laughs> So if you didn't have this little brush technique, you'd be like, oh, Jesus, what do I do with all that? With the brush, it'll get it right off. So shit. <laughs> so when you're drying the ash, are you just drying the water that you basically added to that dry plant matter? Or is there somehow now like water that is somehow soaked into the membrane of the resin or like how, how does that work? You're, you're really drying the water that you put in there. 
Uh, just on the outside of the plant. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason why I ask is because yeah. just because listen to people talk and stuff, I'm not going to get into it. Sure. Some people would advocate for like a three month drying time. Yeah, well, you know, that, that's definitely going to gonna dry your resin more. You're going to have more terpene lots because the terpenes will migrate out of the resin head. Um, so, yeah, but, but I'd say that, you know, the fresher you can smoke it, the more terpene content you're going to have in there. Just as um, long as you're sure you got that. Yeah, as long as it's going to be shelf stable. Yeah. So, there you have it. <laughs> Bubble hatch. Would you repeat yeah. this then three more times? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and how much more would you get uh, based on what you get there? Would you get 50% more? Yes, yeah, at least. At least. Um, so, you know. So you started with 133 grams. Uh -huh. What are you going to end up with there? So, generally, you're going to have in between five and, you know, the highest I've ever had was 17% on that Acme Street. Um, so from, from your original plant materials weight, you'll have 5% um, on account of the low end. I've had a little bit less than 5% as well, uh, but it just kind of depends on the starting material. Yeah. Are you going to reuse the water that's in that bucket now? I would reuse bucket? this water. <laughs> exactly. Tea yeah. with that water? Yeah. Uh, tea with that water? Yeah, you know, I mean, you can totally drink this. I've actually fermented it with, uh, I've added sugar and yeast and fermented it into a wine. It's a delightful <laughs> wine. <laughs> One more question. Any more? One more? Yes, sir. So, how long did you say you were going to dry that for? Uh, so, one week. One week. Okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of the, the perfect thing. You can smoke it tomorrow uh, without, right. it, without it sizzling and popping. Uh, but, but if you want to put it into a storage container, uh, you'll want to wait a week. At a, at a temperature. It's just like room temperature. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, definitely having a colder environment is better. It's going to... It's not going to melt the resin heads and, and trap water in there as readily if you have it in a colder environment. Is that right? Keep low humidity on that as, as well. Or? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Just that. You know, you really it's really a dry room, and it's done the next day. It's completely dry and ready, ready to package. So. Uh, cool. Right on. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah.